Back in my university days, a few guys invited me to play Warhammer 40k. They took their Warhammer very seriously. They knew the lore of this fictional universe better than I knew the real history I was trying to write a dissertation on. I declined because I didn't know the lore and the rules seemed too Byzantine to be any fun. But I've been looking into the lore of Warhammer 40k recently, and I had a moment of resonance with it. I've come away with a different impression, one that might even be considered... heresy. For those not familiar with this brutal universe that gave us the term grimdark, a brief rundown. It's the 41st millennium. Most of humanity, and trillions of people across millions of worlds, are united under the Imperium of Man, ruled over by the God Emperor. Well, technically. You see, 10,000 years ago, a fellow by the name of Horus kicked off a civil war and nearly killed his shininess. Since then, the Emperor has been a catatonic near corpse propped up in a golden life support throne, and the Imperium is ruled by a sticky spaghetti ball of overlapping bureaucracies that even the 40k sourcebooks can't keep straight. We'll talk about why the Emperor is still vitally important in a bit, but for now, just know that the far future of the 41st millennium is a dark age, and life in the Imperium is miserable. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future there is only war. Fun times. Mostly the Imperium just wages war. War against various alien races, Xenos is a blanket term, which come in classic fantasy flavors like space elves, space dwarves, and space orcs. War against demons, because there are demons in this universe, and actual evil gods directly interacting with people. And of course, factions of the Imperium spend some time fighting each other. There is only war, because at its core it's a tabletop war game and people need to be able to play it regardless of which faction in the army they've dumped a bunch of time and money into is. But that's a whole other story. Interstellar travel in 40k is achieved through the warp. Engage. No, the warp is a realm of chaos inhabited by malicious entities. Yeah, more like that. Traversing the warp requires psychic navigators, but without some reference point, ships would never find their way through, and that's where the Emperor comes in. Because he's mostly a spirit at this point, his consciousness exists beyond the physical plane, and this ghost Emperor spends the millennia fighting the forces of chaos in the nether realms and keeping a beacon going in the void, a psychic light by which the ships of mankind can navigate. Without the Emperor, the Imperium collapses. Not just in political terms, but maintaining contact across the millions of planets would be physically impossible. The Emperor is quite literally the light holding the Imperium together. The catch is that maintaining this beacon requires sacrifices. Specifically, psychers, as they're called, people with highly developed paranormal capacity that allows them to perceive the contours of the warp, among other abilities. They assist the Emperor in his efforts to impose order in the warp and hold back the chaos, and in so doing, they are consumed. Hundreds of them every day. The Imperium of Man is fueled by literal human sacrifice so that the war against all can continue for another day. And the Imperium's most recognizable fighting force are the Space Marines, of which there are a bunch of chapters and they all have their own lore, named characters, special bullshit moves, and all that other stuff I'm not going to get into. Space Marines, or the Adeptus Astartes as they are known in Warhammer Pseudo-Latin, are modified super soldiers. They're eight feet tall, they have immense strength, they have an extra heart and lung, they can spit acid, and they're essentially immortal. And they're exclusively male. At least nominally. I mean, after the extensive operations and genetic modifications involved, they're not really human anymore, either physically or genetically. Do Astartes have functional man parts? I've only read a fraction of the vast body of written lore, but I'm under the impression no. But in outward appearance, they're big, hulking, muscular dudes, exclusively. There's reasons given in the lore for this, which have sparked a whole series of essays and Reddit threads arguing about sexism, market demographics, and hegemonic masculinity, which is an odd point of contention when talking about super soldiers that are literally made by opening up children and replacing most of their internals with harvested parts and processed Superman juice from prior successes. 
Yeah, the Empyrean is already horrifying, but is anyone actually wanting a story about little girls being ripped open and turned into genocidal war hulks through years of pain and hardship? I'll pass. Yet, despite the grimness, the Imperium can be a funny place sometimes. I don't mean satire, exactly. It takes itself seriously as sci-fi war stories set in a dying, miserable universe. Though I must say, broadly speaking, it does a fine job of skewering bureaucracy and government in general as a bloated, malicious maelstrom of self-serving swine that would have subsumed everything long ago if they were slightly less incompetent. The Gothic religious overtones feed into this well, and that pseudo-Latin naming of everything lends it a weight of ponderous pomposity that I find hilarious. I mean, imagine going into the DMV and facing some dour-looking clerk proclaiming the sanctity of the Adeptus Administratum in the name of the God Emperor of Man. I couldn't keep a straight face. And yet there's something else. The Imperium is oppressive, inefficient, and hopelessly corrupt dependent on a rotting carcass and a chair to hang together in a universe full of malicious chaos demons and genocidal xenos trying to wipe it out. On the surface, it seems dark and hopeless. But I'm not sure it is, because while reading through Warhammer novels, rulebooks, faction codices, and essays on why Warhammer is just a masculine fantasy for misogynists and closet fascists, I realize that it's not the grim, dark hopelessness that I initially assumed. And it's encapsulated by this passage, which I read in the 7th edition codex, because 7th edition is the one I got for free. Mankind stands on the verge of an evolutionary change tens of thousands of years in the making. If humanity can survive the trauma of change, it can cast off the mundane shackles of its current form to begin a new epoch of psionic mastery, an era of wonderment and the dawning of a hitherto unseen golden age. Throughout the Imperium, the tide of psychically active humans continues to rise on a daily basis. Yet that mankind will survive this deluge at all is by no means certain. Against this backdrop of a galaxy at war, the Imperium faces an unrelenting doom. If the ever-increasing numbers of rogue psychers are not controlled, what they unwittingly unleash will further strain the fabric that holds the warp at bay. Should too many holes be punctured through reality, should that gap ever be too widely bridged, then the powers within the warp will burst forth to consume the galaxy. A time of endless night presses in, and everywhere the enemies of mankind gather like eaters of carrion. Only the Emperor's foresight and preparation stand a chance of seeing humanity through such end times. And this crystallized my impression of the 40k universe and why everything happens the way it does. We can dismiss this as Imperium propaganda, fine. But if we take it as potentially true, then all the war and struggle isn't hopeless. Brutal, desperate, making terrible sacrifices not only of lives but morality. But in that context, there's reason to it. Not justification, not absolution, but it's no longer nihilistic, feudal war. It's fighting not only to preserve humanity today, but to achieve a real future in the face of near-certain doom. And that, together with the brutalist World Wars design style of the Imperium military, reminds me of a historical analog. Because of course it does, that's my thing. In the last year of the Second World War, Germany was firmly on course to defeat. Their only hope was either an allied mistake of such enormity that it would end the war on its own, or a separate peace in the West. The former was astronomically improbable, and the latter was completely ruled out by the Western Allies. Most of Germany's leaders knew they were facing certain defeat. The people knew, and yet they fought on, and they fought well. Why? Because surrender didn't simply mean losing a war. Pay some reparations, get a new flag, feel like losers for a few years while you rebuild. It meant brutal and utter destruction. It wasn't propaganda, it was what the Allies said they were going to do. The Morgenthau Plan, proposed by U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, was accepted as Allied policy for a time. Roosevelt and Churchill initially signed off on it as the framework for post-war Germany. The Morgenthau Plan called for the dismantling of most German industry, turning the country into an agricultural colony and keeping the German standard of living down to subsistence levels. The Soviet Union would receive reparations in the form of assets, territory, and forced German labor outside Germany. Subjugation, starvation, and slavery. 
The plan was dropped due to a heavy pushback within the administration, most notably from Henry Stimson, head of the then-named War Department, moral revulsion amongst the American people, and of course its propaganda value in Germany. Because when that is the price of defeat, you fight. No matter what the odds, no matter how unattainable victory might appear, fighting is the only option left, and dying in battle is preferable to being a starving slave while your entire people is destroyed. The encroaching horde may wipe you out, but if that is their goal, then the only purpose left in life is to make them pay for every inch of ground they take. And that's Warhammer 40k. There are no good guys. You might have a favorite army, you might like the lore or think they look cool, but there are no objectively good sides. And yet, if humanity in the Imperium is evolving towards some new plane of non-physical existence, as the earlier passage implies, then the fight isn't completely in vain. It's buying time, holding back the ruin for another day, and maybe averting the worst of it. Just as in our own history, Germany was spared complete destruction, largely because it fought on even when victory was out of reach, and thereby gained less onerous terms and defeat that allowed them to start over. Now, I can almost hear someone somewhere saying, See? Warhammer is for Nazis! You just said so! But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that Germans are people, even when ruled by a horrendous, murderous, grimdark regime, and when faced with an onslaught of demons openly bent on destroying them in creatively malicious ways, the only sensible thing for them to do was to fight to the bitter, bloody end. And that's made me think about 40k not only in terms of its own story, but as a cultural echo of our real history. It bears a heavy British influence, of course, but it's broad enough to resonate. An amalgam of influences, it's a style you could almost call pan-second millennium, with its fusion of medieval world wars and 20th century space opera. An orbital drop pod disgorging armored knights charging towards a line of boxy, primitive-looking tanks is absurd. And yet it works. Because all the pieces are in some way familiar. Because after a cursory examination of European history, of human history even, one could be forgiven for concluding that there is only war. Maybe we do live in a grimdark sort of world and we're just used to it. But it's not a hopeless world. And somehow the slenderness of that thread makes it feel that much stronger. And with this new impression of the Warhammer 40k universe, I think I'll read more of it. I may even try a game or two. I still think the rules are a bastard son of the tax code, but the idea of pitting a thousand-point army of mixed Imperium forces chosen mostly for what I think is cool against 1,500 or 2,000-point opposition has a certain appeal. Yeah, it's not strictly in accord with the rules as codified in the 10th edition core book, but Anyone that's going to make a crusade out of arbitrary minutiae of faction keywords or squad structure probably isn't someone I want to sit at a table with anyway. Or maybe that's just the chaos talking. In any case, I don't think I'm done with Warhammer, a universe full of malicious chaos demons. Chipmunks. <laughs>